All right, we are in the final part. <laughs> Give me there. We are in the final part of uh, Hebrews. We are in the final part of Hebrews. And tonight we are going to wrap it up with Hebrews chapter 9 through uh, 13, chapters 9 through 13. So the last five chapters of uh, Hebrews, the last five chapters of Hebrews. So it's been a blessing. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get right into the word. The Lord, we just thank you for gathering us tonight, O Lord. We just thank you that we have the opportunity to come into your presence, O Lord, and to study your word and to just gain more wisdom from your word, to gain more understanding. May your word be written all in and through our hearts, O Heavenly Father. We thank you. I thank you for each and every person who is joining us via Zoom, via Facebook, via YouTube, O Lord. I thank you, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. We're kicking it off with Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. So here in Hebrews chapter 9, you're going to realize we're talking about the old. Uh, this is all really going to focus a little bit on the, on the Old Testament and how they had the earthly sanctuary. And we're going to learn about the tabernacle here a little bit. So. And then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna. Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant and, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail so now the author of Hebrews here he just gave you a visual of uh, the tabernacle and how it was built and how it was separated okay Verse six, now when these things have been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So as you see here, uh, the priests, so any priest, they were able to go into the first part of the tabernacle to perform these services. But then there was only one priest who was selected uh, once a year to go into that second part, which was also known as the holiest of all, okay? Verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. The way into the holiest of all had not yet made had not yet been made manifest. You know why? Because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way to the Father. He is the way, our way to the Father. He is the holy, he is the holiest of holy. So we must remember that in this initial tabernacle, while yes, this room may, may have been known as the holiest of all, today, Jesus is the way. Back then, that room was the way to get to the Father, and that is where the priest the high priest will go into one once a year will go into that room to present the offerings before god but today we get to get to the father through jesus and jesus only so it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience concerned only with foods and drinks various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation OK, so the priest had to do this once a year, at least go into the holiest of all. OK, the holy, the holy room. Um, and as you notice, they had to do this year after year after year. And this took place for many, 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 many generations. This took place over thousands of years, probably. So we must remember, I shouldn't say thousands of years, but hundreds of years. So we must remember that. Um, this took place over and over and over again because simply these sacrifices, they weren't enough. They weren't enough. They weren't the ultimate sacrifice. Verse 11, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Christ was not of this world. 
just as we are of this world, but see, we may be in it, but Christ, he was not of this world. He was not created the same way we all were. He was literally God in the flesh, not with the blood of goats and calves, verse 12 here, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. I love this scripture here of verse 12, because you see that Earlier on in Hebrews chapter 9, the priests had to go in with the blood of goats, the blood of calves. They had to bring in sacrifices. But when Christ came, because he came as our high priest, and he is the one and only true living high priest today, because he came as our high priest, he was the one who said, hey, it's only my blood. It's going to be my blood that's going to be shed at my at the altar. It's going to be my blood that's going to be shed on the cross. It's going to be my blood that is shed for the remission of sins. For if the blood of bulls, verse 13 here, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God? Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Only the blood of Jesus will cleanse us, not the blood of any goat, not the blood of any heifer, not the blood of any calf, not the blood of any animal. Only the blood of Christ will cleanse you of your sin. So if anyone is in that mentality or in that thinking of, oh, we still have to sacrifice lambs, we have to sacrifice goats, we have to sacrifice heifers and calves. No, no, that is wrong thinking. Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He only had to do it once. He didn't have to die over and over and over again. He only had to do it once because his blood was enough. This is why when they do these things in Israel, this is why, this is how you know they haven't all accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior because they're still, they're still sacrificing calves and lambs and goats and heifers, they're still sacrificing all of that because they don't believe that the blood of Jesus was enough. Verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the, of the eternal inheritance. What does that word mediator mean? Because the Bible here in Hebrew says that Jesus is the mediator. Well, mediator means one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship or form a compact or for ratifying a covenant, a medium of communication or also known as an arbitrator. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we know that Jesus, he intervened. He intervened for our our sins. He intervened in between the old covenant and now the new covenant. He made sure that, hey, those who, who those who were faithful, those who lived with God, who lived for God before he came, he intervened and said, you know what? You're going to be saved. You're going to come, you're going to enter into my eternal inheritance. You're going to eat, you're going to inherit your eternal reward. Jesus is our mediator. Verse 16, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. What is a testament? A testament means to uh, make a covenant, enter into a covenant with one. As we all know, Jesus made a covenant. We are in the Old Testament. So when people say testament, they're saying old covenant and new covenant. So when you hear Old Testament and New Testament, what you're really saying is old covenant and new covenant. Under the new covenant, we are saved by the blood of Jesus. Under the old covenant, they were saved really under the law. They were required to do things that they didn't live by the law, then they weren't saved. Now, I always like to make clear to people, does that, does that mean that the law of Moses is not relevant? No. We are still not to commit adultery. We are still to honor our parents. We are still to be faithful to our wives. We are still to not covet. We are not to put any other gods and any other graven image before us. No, we are still to only worship the one and only true living God. All of that still stands. But see, under the old covenant, they had to bring sacrifices, like I said, year after year after year after year. But under this new covenant, because of the goodness of Jesus and the love of the love that God has for us. We no longer have to do that. We are saved by his blood. Verse 17, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. 
For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Blood was necessary. This is why Jesus, you know, the first time he came here on earth, he didn't come to wage war. He didn't come to fight back. He came to lay down his life. He knew that blood was a requirement. Ladies and gentlemen, blood is important. You know, they're, 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 this is why I always say blood is serious in the eyes of God. Blood is no joke. This is why Jesus came and he shed his blood. He didn't shed his tears. He didn't shed his sweat. Yes, he had tears. Yes, he sweated. I'm sure he, you know, yes, all of that. But ultimately, he needed to shed his blood on the altar for our remissions of sins. Imagine today still having to go out and get a goat, to go out and get a calf or a heifer, whatever. Imagine going out and getting an animal, slicing them at the throat, cutting their throat open and shedding the blood before the altar imagine having to do that or having to give your pet up to a pastor to a priest whoever imagine doing that and because you needed to shed blood for the remission of your sins a lot of animal lovers today that would hurt them a lot of people today would say oh, i don't want nothing to do with that but i love the fact that we don't have to do that no more i love the fact that jesus came and he shed his blood so that we don't have to do that year after year after year Amen and amen. Verse 23, therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Notice the things that, that the sacrifices that took place here on earth and the practices that were being done. The Bible makes it clear. It was a copy of what goes on in heaven. It was a copy of, hey, blood being shed, blood being put at the altar. But I love it because guess what? That no longer has to take place because Christ, he took care of it all. Verse 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The priest, the, the priest on earth, the priests who were in the flesh, the men who were who went into that room, who went into the tabernacle, and then the one who went once a year into the holiest of all. Notice here that they entered into this room, but they did not enter into the heaven. Yes, the presence of God may have very well been in that room. Yes, the God may have very well been there when that priest offered those sacrifices. But ladies and gentlemen, notice what that priest couldn't do. He could not enter into heaven. Jesus entered into heaven for us. That is what makes him greater than any priest that has ever lived. So verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place, the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So it's like I said earlier, Christ had Christ doesn't have to do this over and over. He's not doing it again. It's one and done forever, for eternity. It's one and done. This is why you either choose you're going to live for Jesus now or he's going to reject you later. Verse 27, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, not a few not some here, not some there. Christ bared the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. That is chapter nine of Hebrews. Let's go on to chapter 10 here. Chapter 10, verse one, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. The law does not save anybody. The law cannot save me. The law cannot save you. I don't care if you present the nicest goat. I don't care if you present the, 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 the cleanest lamb. I don't care if you take your dog, if you take your cat. 
These sacrifices cannot save you. They won't make you perfect. Only the blood of Jesus will make you perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there was a reminder of sins every year. Hence, this is why they had to do it once a year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So I don't care what anyone is telling you. I don't care what any Jew really has to say. Guess what? The blood of the bulls, the blood of the goats that they still present today, that they still think saves them. Guess what? It does not save them of their sins. It does not wash away their sins. Only the blood of Jesus washes away our sins. Verse five. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. God didn't desire the sacrifice and the offering, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. God didn't have pleasure in that. God didn't have pleasure in laying down a calf and laying down a goat. He didn't have pleasure in any of that. But then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. You know what was pleasing to God? You know what settled it all? You know when God said, I am very well pleased. When his son came down on the earth and he gave his life, his one and only begotten son. Remember when Jesus was baptized, the Bible says as he came up out of the water, the sky opened and the voice was heard and it said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God never said, this is my beloved goat in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved calf in, who, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved burnt offering or peace offering in whom I am well pleased. No, he never said that. Those things did not bring pleasure. But he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and offering uh, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law then he said behold i have come to do your will O god he takes away the first that he may establish the second god takes away the first so that he may establish the second and jesus when he came it was to wash away the old and to establish the new now, I like to always tell people, Jesus did not come. He, he even said it himself. I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill it. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. Verse 10, by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Jesus died once for us. He only had to die once for us. Any teacher out there that says, oh, he's going to die again. Any person who believes in reincarnation and believes, oh, Jesus, Jesus is going to come again and he's going to hang on the cross again. They are lying to you. Jesus only had to die once and that is it. He offered his body. He is the eternal sacrifice. Verse 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. I love how the author, of, the author of Hebrews, he is constantly reminding people, he is constantly letting us know, guess what? These things will not take away your sins. Y'all can do them year after year. You can be perfect in the offering that you offer, but it will not save you. This is why I tell people, I don't care if you give a $10 offering. I don't care if you give a $1,000 a $10,000 a $50,000, or if someday you give a million dollar offering to your church. Guess what? There are people who give those offerings and they actually end up in hell because they weren't living for God. They thought they could pay them off. They thought, oh, because I gave this large offering, it was pleasing unto God. No, the author here already said, God has no pleasure in those things. He looks at the heart. Jesus already took care. Jesus is the ultimate offering. He is the ultimate sacrifice. God looks at our heart. Have you accepted my one and only begotten son? But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. One offering. One offering. That's it. Notice Jesus doesn't have to do it over and over and over again. That's really being stressed tonight. 
But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. God didn't say this when they were offering when they were offering calves, when they were offering bulls, when they were offering goats. He said this when his son laid down his life. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. What does that word remission mean? Re remission means release from bondage or imprisonment, forgiveness or pardon of sins, letting them go as if they had never been committed. Remission of the penalty. Ladies and gentlemen, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when you know that his blood will wash away all of your sins, when you repent, when you ask for forgiveness, you are literally being released from bondage. You are literally being released from imprisonment. You may not be sitting in a cell, but guess what? There are so many people today who are spiritually in bondage. They are spiritually in prison because they have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They call on his name, but he's not in their hearts. The blood of Jesus, it releases, it breaks every chain. His name alone breaks every chain. You wanna come out of the bondage. You wanna come out of the anxiety. You wanna come out of the depression. You wanna come out of that stress. You wanna come out of your head. Guess what? You got to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. His blood washes away all sins for the remission, the remission, the remission of our sins. Amen, amen, amen. Verse 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Notice there's no more curtains anymore. There's no more big old white veil hanging up. The veil is literally Jesus. You want to come to the Father? That veil is Jesus. He is the only way. So I don't care who says whatever. There are celebrities that say, oh, there's many ways to come to God. They are lying to you. I don't care what Hollywood has to say. I don't care what your favorite artist has to say. Has to say. I don't care what your favorite actor or actress has to say. There is only one way to God, and that is through his son, Jesus. So through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Jesus is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. Notice that the closer the, the return, the Jesus' second return is, more and more people are falling away. He prophesied that actually. He said, hey, in those days, many will fall away. Well, you know what that tells me? In order for many to fall away, there have to already be many present. He didn't say a few. He didn't say a little. So when we read on all these articles, when we look up maybe Christian articles and we see why aren't people returning to church? Why are people being lukewarm? Why don't people care about gathering with their brothers and sisters in Christ? It's because the falling away is happening. Some may even say it already happened. It's still happening. People are still saying, you know what? I don't need to gather with my brothers and sisters. I don't need to be there in the flesh with them. I don't need to be in their presence. And that is exactly what Satan wants them to do. Are you going to hell if you stream every now and then? Are you going to hell if you stream once a month, if you stream twice a year or how, whatever? I'm not saying you're going to hell over that. But you should be intentional about gathering with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I tell people all the time, if maybe you're not feeling the church you're going to, maybe you're not being reached, maybe you're not being fed. And you say, well, I feel like the Lord is calling me elsewhere. Then be obedient, of course, to the Holy Spirit and go wherever it is that the Lord is calling you to go. But some people use the excuse that because they weren't being fed or one church, they just weren't receiving anything. They use the excuse to say, well, I'm no longer going to go to church. I'm no longer going to gather with my brothers and sisters. No, 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 no. The Bible makes it clear in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. 
not forsake. Do not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. That is the manner of some, but you do not want to be in that place. Because as the day approaches where Jesus returns, many will fall away. Verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Oh my goodness. How many of us have insulted the spirit of grace? We live in a time, we live in a generation where many people today, they believe because they live under the dispensation of grace. They believe because they live under the new covenant, they can do whatever they want, live however they want, act however they want, talk however they want. They can do whatever and they say, well, the Lord has grace and the Lord has mercy. The Bible says it here. You are insulting the spirit of grace and your judgment will be worse. Your judgment will be worse because you knew better. This is why I, I, I've told Crystal before this ministry. I, I, I'm just real. You got to know what type, what, what, what calling God has put on you. Do I want to reach people? Do I want people to come to Christ? Absolutely. But I noticed the majority of my teachings, it's already correcting those who are already in the body. It's correcting the members because many think because they became a member of Christ, they became a member of this body. They can slack off. No, you can take days off of the gym. You can take days off of, 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 where, of the why. You can take days off or wherever you're a member at. But when you're a member of this body of Christ, this is a 24-7 commitment. I don't even like to say it's a daily commitment. It's a 24-7 commitment. Every second, every minute, every hour, you are committed. You are devoted to Christ. So don't sit here and think, oh, because we are under the dispensation of grace, I can cuss. I can listen to this ungodly music. I can watch these ungodly movies. I can I can fornicate. I can get drunk. I can do all these things. If you think you can do all of that just because you live under this time of grace, the Bible makes it clear here. You have insulted the spirit of grace and your judgment will be much worse. Verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. There are many Christians, there are many followers of Christ where they forget God is going to vindicate. And if they insulted the, the, the spirit of grace, if they thought they can get away with whatever, however, all because they go to church once a week or twice a week for an hour, hour and a half, God's going to look at them and say, no, vengeance is mine. You spoke, you said my name out of your mouth, but I was never in your heart. And again, the Lord, it also says again, the Lord will judge his people. I don't know where this teaching came from that I hear sometimes where the body of Christ won't be judged. I don't know why people think, oh, because I went to church once or twice a week for an hour, hour and a half. Oh, I, I'm guaranteed a ticket in heaven. Oh, because I'm an apostle, I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, I'm an evangelist, I'm a prophet, I'm an elder. Oh, guess what? That guarantees my ticket into heaven. God makes it clear. He is going to judge his people. And our judgment is going to honestly be stricter compared to those who didn't know any better, who don't know any better. We know better. Those of you who have been tuning in every single week, those of you who keep up with these teachings every single week, God, God will let you know you knew better. Don't think you just tuned in to support. Don't think you just tuned in just to say, oh, I'm present. No, I was planting a seed in your heart and I was seeing if your ears were open. Are your ears hearing? You know better. You know better. You know better. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the formal days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings what does that word illuminated mean 
after you shined, after you, 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 you were, you were enlightened, after you were informed, after you were given understanding, after you were taught. People think when they come to Christ, things are going to be so much easier. Uh-uh. The Bible makes it clear. No, the walk is probably going to be a little difficult. It's literally a narrow road. I don't know if you all have ever seen those. Uh, I know there are those sometimes families and there's gentlemen, very few individuals in the world who will hang these very tight, these very thin lines, these these tight ropes. And I forgot the name of it, but I even remember as as uh, children, um, my family and I, we would sometimes watch it live where it will be this man and he's hold, holding this this long pole and it's helping him balance himself as he walks on this very thin line. And it was so difficult. So, you, you know, he, he made it look easy, but that was not natural. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I like to say you saw how he had that pole. You look it up. You saw how he walked that thin line. Guess what? That That's how we're walking on the narrow road. But instead of holding a pole, we hold the word of God. We hold the word of God. But some people, they think they can let go of this word. Some people think, oh, I don't need this. Yeah, I love Jesus and I want to be with him for an eternity, but I don't need this. And then what happens? A little wind comes, a little storm comes, a trial here, a tribulation there, and they fall away. They fall away all because they no longer had the word. We got to ensure that we are holding on the word as holding on to the word as we walk that narrow road. Verse 33, partly while you were made a spectacular, both you were made a spectacle, forgive me, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. What was the author saying here? We are going to go through trials and tribulations. We are going to suffer, but you have to keep your mind on the things of heaven. This is why Colossians says, keep your thoughts on the things of heaven. Some people, they only keep their thoughts on the things of the world. They keep their thoughts on their money. They keep their thoughts on their home. They keep their thoughts on their bills. They keep their thoughts on their family. They keep their thoughts on worldly things. So when something happens, the enemy uses those things to pull them away from Christ, to draw them away. But we need to remember that if we keep our thoughts on the things of heaven, it's a constant reminder. You know, I may be going through hell in this season. I may be broke, <laughs> I may be ill, I may be struggling the mind, I may be struggling a little bit, I, I, may, I may just be going through it, but I know there's better. I know I'm going to see my king, I know I'm going to be with him in glory, so I'm going to endure this trial, I'm going to endure this tribulation. So verse 35 says, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Y'all, don't give up on God. Don't give up. Don't, don't leave this narrow road. That's a dangerous place. Do not leave it. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. After you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Anyone who, who pulls back, anyone who says, no, nah, I don't think I want anything really to do with Jesus anymore. I'm kind of tired of going to church. I'm kind of tired of serving. I'm, I'm tired of fasting. I'm tired of reading the word. I'm, I'm tired of just always just learning something about the Bible. I'm tired of being corrected. I'm tired of the conviction. I just want to live. I just want to be free. But some people choose bondage at the expense of freedom. You want to be of this world. You want to live. You want to be of this world. You want to do as the world does. You want to so-called be free. Guess what? That's a deception from the enemy. He will have you in bondage because you will go for the you will go before the Father, thinking that you live this free lifestyle and you're just going to walk your way right into heaven. And he goes, Nope, you rejected me. My soul has no pleasure in you. Verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. What does that word perdition mean? We are not of 
We are not, okay? We are not of those who are drawn back to utter destruction. We are not of those who are drawn back to a perishing, a ruin. We are not of those who are destroyed by money. We are not of those who are destroyed by our trials and tribulations. Those who are drawn back because of their perdition, guess what? They're destroyed. Their heart was in the world. Their heart wasn't truly God's. And that is chapter 10. Going to chapter 11 here. Getting through, getting through. Chapter 11, one of the uh, best chapters in the Bible. It's almost like uh, the, the hall of fame of those who have faith. So verse one, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Y'all know some athletes, they take substances. People today, they take vitamins. They take uh, nutrients. They do these things, you know, to be healthy, to be in good shape, to be stronger, to run faster, whatever it may be. Well, guess what? Your, your substance of things hoped for is faith and the evidence of things not yet seen. When someone has faith, when, some believe, when someone believes something is going to happen, God is going to do it. Even though they can't see it yet, even though they can't quite touch it yet. That is evidence that they have faith. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The world was made by the word of God. The worlds were framed by the word of God. This is why it blows my mind even to this day that there are still people who reject the existence of the living God, who reject the existence of the living God. Who do you think created space? Who do you think created the universe? Who do you think put each and every star where it is? No man did that. No astronaut did that. No dictator, nobody did that. That was only God Almighty. And by his word alone, he created all. Verse four, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, still speaks. So we all know about the story of Cain and Abel. Cain brought, brought an offering that wasn't pleasing to God, and Abel did. As a result, Cain got upset. He murdered his brother Abel. But isn't it funny, even though Abel has been dead for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we still say we are to give our offerings like Abel gave his. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you think you're pleasing God with your money, if you think you're pleasing God with your home, with your car, with whatever it is, you have materialistic. But if you don't have faith, you ain't pleasing God at all. Enoch here. Notice here, the Bible says God had taken him for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We all know about Enoch. The Bible says Enoch literally walked with God, literally walked with God. That was his man just talking to him, conversation every day, every day, every day. We talk about pray without ceasing. Imagine having that conversation with God. That's your prayer. That's our prayers today. And God just took him right on up. Verse seven, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. They didn't know about rain back then. They had never heard of the world flooding. They, they, they weren't concerned about water. What? Rain. Noah said it's going to flood. Nah, that man tripping. But by faith, Noah being divinely warned of the things not yet seen to move with godly fear. Godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. I don't even have to talk about the story of Noah. We know about him. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. 
and he went out not knowing where he was going. You know, one thing I love about Abraham, God literally told him, hey, you got to leave your family behind and you're going to leave your comfort zone. So I know you were raised in Northwest Indiana in your entire life. I know you were raised, you were raised in the Chicago suburbs your entire life. I know you were, way, you were raised in, in whatever state, whatever country, whatever city. I know you were raised here, but Abraham, I'm switching it all up and God can very well do the same thing for us. And people move by faith. That still happens today. Abraham moved by faith without knowing where he was going. Some people don't start businesses because they don't know how the business is going to turn out. Some people quit their ideas. They give up on the vision that God has given them because they can't. They don't know how it's going to turn out. They don't know how it's going to work out. Some people give up on their families. They give up on their spouse. They give up on their children all because they didn't have faith. Abraham, no idea where he was going. Yeah, he said, Lord, I trust you. I'm following you. Let's just be real. How many of us would do that today? How many of us would move without even knowing where we were going? And I'm not talking about you doing it on your own, your own will, your own strength, your own might. I'm talking about God literally told you, you've got to get up and go. Leave your job. Uh, you got to leave this group of friends alone. Are you comfortable in this community? I'm telling you to go out. A lot of people today will say, well, I don't know how it's going to work out. I need to plan my finances. I need to plan all this. I need to have all that in order. And I'm not saying you're evil for thinking that way. But Abraham, the Bible makes it clear, that man literally got up and just bounced. You know, and I like to say with no hesitation, but I'm sure it was a little difficult. He was in his comfort zone. But the Bible says he went out not knowing where he was even going by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with isaac and jacob the heirs with him of the same promise for he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is god by faith sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, yes, Sarah, you know, she told Abraham to go sleep with Agar. And this whole war we see today between Israel and Hamas, this is really a war between Israel and Ishmael. That's all it is. It's still a war between uh, Israel and Ishmael. That's all it is. But Abraham knew that God was faithful afterwards. When God confirmed again, hey, you laughed in the tent. Why did you laugh? She said, uh -uh, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. I heard you. By this time next year, you will have a son. And Abraham, or not Abraham, Sarah held her, held God faithful to that promise. And even at an old age, even at the age of 80 or 90, however old she was, Sarah bore a child. Verse 12, therefore from one man and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. God promised it, y'all. But guess what? There wouldn't be so, the, Abraham wouldn't have so many descendants as God promised if he never would have moved without knowing where he was going. He was obedient. He moved by faith. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better. That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. When you read that scripture, notice there is something so amazing here. God is not ashamed to be called their God. Meaning there are some people who say, well, yeah, God is my God, but they have no faith. And he goes, <laughs> God probably was just like, mm, these people, they ain't got no faith. They're calling me their God. They say they lean on me. They say they trust me, but I tell them to do something and they just think so much with their mind and they, they, 
they say with their mouths that my word is is enough, but really it's not. If I don't give them a map, if I don't show them a route, if I don't give details as to where they're going or why they're even leaving, they won't they won't do it. They they just think so much. They're too smart to truly have faith. This is why we have to understand that hey, we desire God, we desire a relationship with him. You must have faith. Everything is not going to make sense in this time. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was of whom it was said, and Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the, of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Joseph even knew that Egypt was not the land in which the Israelites would be inheriting. Joseph knew this is not the homeland for God's people. Literally, before he died, he said, hey, prepare to take my bone someday. That is faith. Joseph did not live to see the people in their exile out of Egypt, but he had faith that he knew God's people are going to be delivered out of Egypt someday. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. Y'all know back then when you read the book of Exodus, Pharaoh said, kill all the Hebrew boys. Kill all the Hebrew babies. The Hebrews are becoming too many. And if they continue to grow in number, they may one day overrun us. But Moses' uh, parents, they hit him. The Bible says for three months, they held on to the promise of God. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It is faithful when you choose to suffer rather than to have enjoyment of life, rather to embrace the you only live once lifestyle. I tell my wife all the time, I choose to suffer than to have fun. I choose God. I choose Jesus. Even if that means I got to suffer for it for a season, even if that means, hey, I'm going to go through some tough times in this life. I'd rather suffer knowing that I'm going to inherit eternal life than be free and party and be wild and live recklessly thinking that I'm living the life, thinking that I'm only living once just to come before the father and hear him say away from me. I never knew you. Joseph chose, or Joseph, forgive me. Moses chose suffering over pleasure. That's so good. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Do you esteem Christ? Let's just put, let's, let's put that scripture in context here. Let's, let's apply it to us. Do you esteem the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of the United States of America, greater than the treasures of your 401k, greater than the treasures of your Roth IRA? Do you esteem the reproach of Christ greater than the materialistic things here on earth? By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. You know why the Egyptians drowned? They didn't have faith. And some people today wonder why they can't walk through water. Some people wonder today why God won't make a way. You have no faith. Some people today wonder, why won't God do this in my life? Why won't he spread my Red Sea? You don't have faith. That's a straightforward answer right there. I bet you if you have faith and you stood at the shore of your Red Sea, I guarantee you God will part those waters. The waters have to. Psalm 77 says they got to move when, he, when, they, when, when the waters are in his presence, when they sense his glory, they've got to move. 
Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness, were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. The author is literally telling you like, hey, people of faith, they chose the, the, the worst things. They chose the suffering over the prospering, at least what America says prospering is. They chose the suffering. They chose Christ over their life over here. Remember, Christ said those who seek to save their lives will only lose it, but those who are willing to lose their lives will save it. Verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Y'all, those who were of faith, they were mocked, they were scourged, and they were in chains and they were in prison. Let's keep going on here because so many people say, oh, I'm a man of faith, I'm a woman of faith, but they don't even know what that means. Verse 37, they were stoned. They were sawn in two, meaning imagine somebody taking a saw. Imagine being in a country where because you professed your faith in Jesus, they took a saw and they sawed you in half. That is not a pleasant death. That is very well painful. Being stoned was painful. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and ghost dens, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. This world is not worthy of you and I. This world is not worthy of, 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 of the brothers and sisters in Christ. But God has us here for a reason. He has us here for a purpose. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Do you know that you have something better in God? Do you know that there is a promise? There is an eternal inheritance that is waiting for you. You got to choose faith. You got to choose God. You got to remain faithful. Hebrews chapter 12, that was verse 11. Last two chapters, y'all. Last two chapters. We're going to get through them. Like I said, tonight's teaching is going to be a little bit longer, but we're going to get through it. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Y'all, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. There are angels who are witnessing. Those who went on from glory to glory. Guess what? They're witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance. Let us run with endurance. Let us run with endurance. Y'all, you know what this means? This race is going to feel a little long. You're going to have to do multiple laps around the track. You're going to have to do some ups and downs. You're going to have to run cross country. You're going to have to do a few 5Ks. You're going to have to do a few marathons in this life. But guess what? The Bible says run with endurance. The race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Let me say it again. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Nobody else, no other man, no other woman. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Y'all, that's a good thing. That's so, that shows he loves you. That shows that you are still his child. This is why, hey, if you have that conviction still, that's a good thing. You don't want to lose that conviction. You don't want to lose that sense of, you know what, should I be listening to this? Should I be looking at, should I be looking at this? Should I be, should I be speaking of this? Should I be behaving this way? It's good when the Lord chastens you. It's good when he rebukes you. That shows he loves you. 
For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? I got to chasten Solomon. Solomon is two years old. He doing something to try uh, my wife and I every day, his mother and I every day, every day now, literally. But because we love him, we correct him. If we didn't love Solomon, if we didn't care for him, if we just say, hey, whatever, this kid going to do whatever he want, we would just say, screw it. Do whatever you want, Solomon. Eat whatever you want. Talk however you want. Behave however you want. Scream however you want. But because we love him and because we want the absolute best for him, we correct him. But if verse eight, but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. This is why when I hear celebrities say, or even just those of the world who have all this money and all this fame, and they say, oh, well, you know, life is cool for me. Oh, you know, I ain't struggling. I mean, oh, I, I got way more than enough money. I got multiple homes. I got penthouses. I got this. I got that. They're illegitimate to me. The money is illegitimate to me. This is why I tell, like Crystal knows, I am not impressed by anyone's money. I am not impressed by anyone's name. I am not impressed by any house. I'm not impressed. Do I acknowledge, hey, yeah, beautiful home. Hey, yeah, uh, you got a lot of money. I'm not impressed by it. That doesn't mean you're a son. We need to stop as a, as a people of God. We need to stop saying, oh, just because someone has a lot of money, they are blessed. They are a child of God. That is not equivalent to being blessed because the Bible even makes it clear. There are wicked people who cut corners, who oppress others. And as a result, they become wealthy, but they've become wealthy in their greed. We've got to address that. They're illegitimate. They're not his children. Verse nine, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. When my dad would correct us, we paid him respect. When my mom corrected us, we paid her respect. My brother and I, this is why we respect them today because they corrected us. Now, don't get me wrong. We're all pretty much grown at this point and that correction no longer has to pretty much take place. At least I hope not for my three younger brothers, uh, <laughs> which I know it doesn't, but the point is, as children, we paid them respect because they corrected us. And we paid them respect today because they corrected us. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? We need to put some respect on God's name. We talk about putting respect on everybody and every on everybody else's name and every other thing. Put some respect on God's name. His name is holy. His name is above all. His name is glorious. Put some respect on his name. Respect your heavenly father. Verse 10, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. It never felt good when my dad would whoop us. It never felt good when my mom would whoop us. It never felt good being hollered at being uh corrected being uh chastened y'all it's it's normal it's fleshly it never feels good that's part of growth i love it how the bible makes it clear here the altar made it clear be joyful for the present no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful it's going to be painful it's going to hurt when when jesus rebukes you when he corrects you it's going to hurt i imagine the churches when remember we went over the uh, the, uh when we went over revelation and we read all the letters to the churches I imagine it probably hurt some of those churches to see what Jesus said. It probably hurt to say, man, like, here it is. We thought we were on fire. We thought we were doing a good thing. And Jesus says, I don't even, I'm, I'm not even present there. Y'all, y'all, y'all flame is running thin. It probably was painful in the moment, but look at what the author said here. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The correction is a training. The chastening is a training. The rebuke is training. Verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. 
For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire into blackness and darkness and tempness, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall not, it shall not, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sign that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. We need to have that same fear and trembling of God today. Some people have truly lost the fear of God. It's evident in their carelessness of how they live. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Do not refuse God, y'all. Don't refuse the word. Some people will refuse listening to this because we are literally reading the word of God. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptedly with reverence and godly fear. We are to serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. There are people today who are serving God in an unacceptable manner. They have no reverence for him and they do not fear him. I shared a post on Facebook the other day and I said a reverend with no reverence for God is simply a wolf in sheep's clothing. If you are a reverend, if you call yourself a teacher, if you call yourself a man or a woman of God and you have no reverence for God whatsoever, you are a wolf in a sheep's clothing. And I have no shame in saying that. For our God is a consuming fire. What consumes you? Who consumes you? What consumes your time? God, our God, is a consuming fire. That was chapter 12. Chapter 13 is a lot shorter. Let's get through it here. Let brotherly love continue. The author said, let your brotherly love continue. Continue to love your brothers and sisters. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing, some, by doing so, some have unwittingly, meaning unknowingly, entertained angels. Just because someone is a stranger, just because someone looks homeless, just because someone looks poor, just because someone looks like they may not be important and they may be bothering you, it may very well be an angel in disguise to see how you treat those who are, how you treat strangers. To see, hey, you say you love God and you say you'll help those in need. Let's see how you treat a stranger who you don't even know. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Don't forget the prisoners, y'all. We have a habit of looking down on men and women who are in prison. And every single one of them aren't even justly in prison. Don't look down on them. Verse four, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. We live in a time, we live in a generation. Unfortunately, I hear young people today they're trying to normalize having multiple wives or having multiple husbands. They're trying to normalize and being these and being in these polygamous relationships. Y'all, that is not of God whatsoever. One husband, one, one wife, one man, one woman. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Be content with what you have, y'all. Stop comparing yourself to what everybody and everybody, what, what everybody and their mama or their daddy got. Be content with what you have. When you say you're blessed, it tells me you're content with what you have. But some people say, oh, I'm blessed, but they still coveting what somebody else has. They still coveting in the house. They're still coveting the car. You don't even know that you're blessed then. Be content. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I would not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, 
who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to read that verse one more time. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. Stop believing everything and everyone what they say. You got to confirm it for yourself in the word of God. Read the word of God for yourself. This is why I tell people, if you don't believe me, if you, if you question me a little bit, that's fine. Go to the word yourself and you'll see whether what I'm saying is true or not. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. You know why? Because Jesus already came. So if you still participate in that practice of burning animals, of presenting these offerings that are no longer needed, guess what? You outside the camp, you ain't even in the body. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach outside the camp. Go to Jesus. Uh, therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Isn't it funny? We're in this season of Thanksgiving. And the scripture here says, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to praise God is even a sacrifice. It is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God is well pleased for those who God is well pleased with those who do good and with those who share. If you got a closed hand, if you if you got fist, God is not pleased, but he's pleased with an open hand. He's pleased with those who are always willing to help others. Verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. If someone is ruling over you and you may say, I don't think they're doing the right thing. Guess what? They got to give an account for it. And I always tell people, go by the word of God, listen to your conviction, be submissive. But if you know it online with the word, check that person say, hey, this ain't, this ain't right. I, I honor you and I, I respect you, but I want you to know right now, this is not right. Let's go to the word. Let's come back to the word. We got to get to that place where we come back to the word. Verse 18, pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I, appeal, and I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Y'all, we got through the book of Hebrews. We've been through quite a few books in the Bible now. That is the book of Hebrews.